For your information, today's uh, webinar will be recorded and we'll be posting this on the Yenjing Academy website, just as we have done so with the previous open information sessions uh, focusing on economics and management and politics and international relations. For your information, we will be having several more open information sessions focusing on different research tracks in the humanities. Those will be literature and culture, history and archaeology, and um, philosophy and religion. Those will be coming up um, over the next month, so please check the schedule on our website if you're also interested in another of the research areas. My name is Brent Haas. I'm Associate Dean and Director of Admission Affairs at the Yenjing Academy. Um, I'm from the United States, Charlotte, North Carolina. Did my undergraduate work at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, focusing on history and minoring in Chinese language. My MA and PhD, both in East Asian history, are from the University of California, San Diego, where I focused on modern Chinese history, uh, mainly 19th and early 20th century history. I've been a study abroad student uh, in two intensive language programs. Uh, in 1999, I attended PIB, the Princeton in Beijing Intensive Language Program at Beijing Normal University, uh, the summer after my second year of university. And one year after I had already graduated, I returned to Beijing, this time at IUP, the Inter-University Program for Chinese Language Studies at Tsinghua University. I've been running study abroad programs for about a decade uh, before I came to the Yanjing Academy two years ago. Uh, the universities uh, for which I ran programs include Duke University, the University of California Education Abroad Program, which is essentially the centralized study abroad program for all 10 University of California campuses. And then I returned to IUP in 2015, this time as the resident director. So that's a little bit about my personal history. Peking University. Um, this university began in 1898 when, as a part of a comprehensive, although ultimately failed, reform movement led by the second to last emperor of the Qing dynasty, Jing Shi Da Xue Tang was created as a part of that reform movement. And that is one of the previous names of what we now know as Peking University or Beijing Da Xue. So uh, that was one of the lasting legacies of this reform movement right at the end of the 19th century. Here are some of the uh, lovely shots of PKU's scenic campus. Uh, beautiful sculpture of historical and cultural figures. Uh, it's really just an exceptional blend of traditional Chinese architecture with the uh, modern necessities of a world-class leading edge um, university. I'm not gonna spend too much time on these, but I will highlight the bottom left here is the famous Peking University Library which has just finished uh, several years of major renovations and is uh, for many students on campus, uh, really the center of uh, their study experience. <clears throat> I will tell you a little bit about these slides. This is the Jingyuan courtyard area. It's a very historically culturally significant part of our campus, the Western sort of central Western part of Peking University's campus. This is where the Yanjing Academy has our administration building our teaching building, as well as our large multimedia lecture hall. You can see the beautiful grassy area um, that is at the center of Jingyuan. And in the middle photograph here, this is the entrance to YCA's administration building. Uh, this is significant not just because of YCA's location, but this was also an important part of the campus of a previous university that used to be active on this spot, Yanjing University. Yanjing University was a... Um, American-run Christian liberal arts college that was active from 1916 to 1952. Now, although Yanjing University and the Yanjing Academy of Peking University share a name and at least share some of the same uh, architectural history, there is no official relationship between the former Yanjing University and uh, the Yanjing Academy of Peking University. But both organizations, I think, were focused on bringing um, new approaches to higher education to the Chinese system of higher education. In the case of Yanjing University, it was about bringing liberal arts education to early 20th century Chinese colleges and universities. And differently, um, the Yanjing Academy is focused on bringing interdisciplinary teaching methods and interdisciplinary research methods to uh, this fairly new 
academic discipline within China, China studies. PKU today is China's uh, most reputable institution of higher education with over 11,500 faculty members who are divided into just over 50 different uh, departments or schools or laboratories. Uh, these faculty members, uh, along with the dedicated staff uh, at Peking University, serve over 46,000 full-time students and um, around 4,300 international students. Although, as you probably know, uh, the vast majority of international students are currently unable to enter China due to travel restrictions as related to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The Engine Academy is a um, highly competitive, fully funded academic master's program uh, focusing on China studies. Um, we are a two-year program. Uh, and having run the inter the uh, admissions program and gotten to know many, many Yanjing scholars over the last several years, I can personally attest to the fact that those who make it into our program are truly outstanding young scholars and future leaders. And YCA is part of a really interesting experiment, both defining what China studies as a discipline in China means, as well as um, integrating interdisciplinary teaching and interdisciplinary research methods into the uh, system of graduate education uh, with the regulations of the Ministry of Education of the PRC. When you have students from uh, diverse backgrounds, national origins, cultural origins, et cetera, all with a shared interest in better understanding today's China, taking classes with PKU faculty, reading some of the same materials, um, engaging in discussions and debate, uh, both inside the classroom, outside of the classroom, in the dormitory, it really does create a, a very unique setting for cross-cultural communication and for uh, what you might call international dialogue. We are a residential college program. So what this means is all Yanjing scholars in their first year are required to live on campus in the Yanjing Academy House. This is a dormitory specifically designed for um, Yanjing scholars. Um, although we are a two-year program, um, international scholars are uh, allowed to not be based in Beijing or in China for all or part of their second year in the program. However, I do not recommend this unless you have a very good reason. Perhaps an internship that is related to your future career plans is available somewhere else and you can't pass it up. Perhaps your research uh, for your master's thesis necessitates that you're based outside of China uh, to have better access to the sources you need. Except for those two specific instances, I would suggest you should plan on spending both years uh, in Beijing because if you want to gain a kind of expertise, any level of expertise on China, you should be able to understand, I think, that one year in Beijing alone is not enough to get to know this city, let alone this vast, complex, and fascinating place called China. For Yanjing scholars from the Chinese mainland, from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, they are required by the terms of their scholarship to be in Beijing for both of the two years of the program. Now, the language of administration and instruction at YCA is English. No prior proficiency or let alone fluency in the Chinese language is required. Now, that having been said, since we are a competitive China Studies Master's program, if you do have previous training, uh, previous experience, like Chinese language proficiency, uh, time living or studying in China, then you would probably want to emphasize that in your application materials because it can be a competitive advantage. If you are a native speaker or a fluent speaker of Chinese, don't worry. There are plenty of opportunities to uh, engage in conversation and communicate with our staff, with other students, with PKU students in Chinese. We've designed our program uh, to um, encourage and sometimes even push Yanjing scholars to further integrate into the academic community and the larger student culture at Peking University. For instance, uh, only half of your course credits are required Yanjing Academy core courses that are only available to Yanjing scholars. The remaining half uh, can be taken as elective courses, either in courses taught for Yanjing scholars or, and we certainly encourage this, courses taught in other schools and departments at Peking University. There are many taught in English, but if you have, uh, if you're a native Chinese speaker 
or you've reached professional fluency in the Chinese language as a non-native speaker, you can take content courses taught in Chinese and other departments and schools. Let's talk funding. Um, at least in North America and its higher education system, it's very difficult, near impossible, to find a fully funded master's degree program. So we try to deal with that issue by offering the Yanjing Fellowship. This is a generous fellowship package that includes full tuition payment. In the first year, it includes free accommodation in the Yanjing Academy House. If in the second year you are based in Beijing but choose to live off campus, you can also receive a housing stipend that'll be sufficient to cover the rental cost for a private bedroom in a shared apartment. And generally that takes place when uh, multiple Yanjing scholars decide to live together off campus. We also offer a monthly stipend of 3000 renminbi that uh, you know, for your living expenses, that's roughly equivalent to about 550, maybe a little bit more US dollars per month. In the first year, we also offer round trip travel to and from your home city or home destination. Um, and then we also offer basic medical insurance that's specifically designed for international students living and studying in China. Now, when you realize that we have in general 120 students per year, and two years of students in the program at one time, I think you can see this is a major financial investment. Therefore, we conduct an academic performance review at the end of the first year in the program. They are very clearly defined um, academic standards that all Yanjing scholars must live up to. These include completing a minimum number of course credits in the first year, maintaining a certain minimum GPA, not failing any of the core required courses in your first year, and not violating certain uh, serious rules in the student uh, handbook and or the laws of the PRC. If you pass all of those standards, which you'll know about at the beginning, you simply reapply for the, the fellowship for your second year and you will receive the fellowship. But we do think it's reasonable to make sure Yanjing scholars are living up to their end of the bargain. In the second year, there are also multiple other funding opportunities. These include teaching assistantships, office assistantships, sometimes a research assistantship, and um, residential advisor positions. Um, so that's a little bit about how we try to take care of the economic needs of Yanjing scholars. This is an important slide, and I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about it. These are the six research concentrations at the Yanjing Academy. Um, these will be important to your academic experience here in four major ways. First, uh, you must choose one of these research areas when you apply to the program. Even though these research areas are quite broad, for instance, law and society both includes legal studies as well as uh, sociology and potentially could also include some anthropological approaches as well. Um, but you must apply to one of these research areas and we will conduct a review of your academic and professional background to ensure that we believe you are set up for success uh, for graduate study and graduate level research in the research area to which you are applying. Now, this does not mean you can only apply to a research area for which you already have a degree uh, in which you have already majored or minored. But uh, it is important that you have already grasped some of the fundamental knowledges and techniques of this mode of academic inquiry, and that's part of part of our admissions review process. So if you would be interested in applying to law and society, but the, you don't think that your academic transcript or your internship experience, etc., will make it obvious that you are already uh, well enough prepared for this research area, then anticipate that we'll have some questions about that and try to address those questions in your application materials. So that's the first way that a research area will affect your academic experience in the application stage. Secondly, um, it's the research area will be important for when you select your thesis advisor at the end of your first year, who will guide you through the thesis uh, design, research, and writing process in year two at YCA. If you are, say, uh, interested in a, a research topic on legal reform over the past 20 years in China, then it sort of obviously makes sense that you might want to choose a research a, a thesis advisor from the Peking University School of Law. 
Conversely, if you're interested in a sociological project, then you should choose your primary thesis advisor as someone from the Department of Sociology. This is because, and this is the third way that uh, a research area will affect your academic experience here. It's the way that Peking University evaluates master's theses. You'll have an oral defense with your thesis advisor and two other faculty members selected by your advisor who will be drawn from either, you know, will be drawn broadly from law and society. It could be a legal scholar, it could be a sociologist. If you're doing a, a sociological look at the education gap in China, it might be someone from the School of Education. After you pass your 30 minute long oral defense with your committee, there's one more important step. And that step is Peking University requires all academic master's theses to successfully pass a, an anonymous faculty review. There will be two faculty members who will take your final draft of the thesis review it, and only after they have uh, determined that this thesis is original, it makes its uh, a sufficient academic contribution appropriate to the master's degree level, only then can you consider to have completed your thesis and be eligible for degree conferral. And the fourth way that these research areas will affect your academic experience is on your graduation diploma. Your diploma will read Peking University, Master of Law, China Studies, Law and Society, or say Peking University, Master of Economics, China Studies, Economics and Management. This is how we've been able to integrate uh, interdisciplinary teaching and interdisciplinary research methods within the previously existing recognized degrees of the Ministry of Education and the PRC. So that's a little bit about uh, the research areas here. I'm happy to talk more about that if anyone has any questions later. Uh, at this moment, I'd also like to mention, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the Q&A section at any point during my presentation. Perhaps one of the staff members in the admissions office will answer your question uh, in the Q&A box itself, or if not, then we'll get to each of your questions uh, at the end of our presentations today. Here are some of the uh, required courses that all first-year students at YCA need to take. Uh, on the upper left box, you can see the four or you know five the four courses that are um, absolutely essential to your time here: China in Transition, Field Study, Topics in China Studies Lecture Series, and Academic Writing. These are all interdisciplinary looks at uh, today's China. Of course, you know we look at history and tradition as well, but it's mainly focusing on the China that you see today and how it developed into what it is. China in Transition One is a, a large lecture course that all Yanjing scholars attend together. Um, with different faculty members from Peking University. And these lectures are followed by, immediately followed by a smaller discussion section breakout for uh, discussion and debate. China in Transition 2 um, uh, narrows down into different sections of the class. And this focuses on field research, guided field research projects uh, led by PKU faculty members within one of the broadly defined research tracks at YCA. The field study is a week-long intensive uh, learning travel experience where we get our scholars to uh, take the educational experience not only outside of the classroom, but also outside of, the, um, outside of Beijing itself. And then Topics in China Studies Lecture Series. Um, this is a, a lecture series, about 15 lectures or so, where we bring in leading figures in different fields that are connected to China Studies to let you know um, some of their experiences, uh, the work they're doing, and the diversity of career tracks that are available for someone with a China Studies degree. Finally, academic writing lets everyone, uh, has PKU professors come in and give um, their thoughts and their advice on different aspects of the thesis process, like designing a project, conceptualizing it, identifying important bodies of secondary literature with which you need to engage, Mm, establishing research questions, carrying out the research and analyzing data, drafting, and finally writing your master's thesis um, paper. All international students are required to take Chinese language in both semesters of their first year, unless an international student has already passed the HSK level six. HSK is the standardized test for uh, assessing Chinese language competency for non-native speakers. If you've taken HSK 6 and passed it, you can place out of our Chinese language courses 
but you're still required to fulfill those same course credits um, through content courses. And the Engine Academy mandates that at least one of these content courses is taught in Chinese. It's a very exciting opportunity, but also a big challenge. For scholars from the Chinese mainland, from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, you are required to take a foreign language in your first year. It cannot be Chinese, it cannot be English, because English is already required to enter the program. And at the bottom, you can see some of the general elective courses that Chinese or that Yanjing scholars uh, often take. Now, these aren't specifically related to China studies per se, nor are they sort of classified within one of the broadly defined research areas, but they're often thing, courses that uh, scholars think are helpful for their career or for preparing um, and learning new methodologies for their master's thesis. Here you can see some of the elective courses that are defined within law and society. On the left, you see YCA courses in the 2021 to 2022 academic calendar. Um, so there's some legal courses, uh, legal studies courses, sociological courses, demographic courses, um, mobility and um, yeah, mobility, frontier societies, et cetera. So a very uh, broad um, series of offerings taught for Yanjing scholars within broadly defined law and society. On the right, you can see some of the Peking University courses that are taught in the School of Law, the Department of Sociology, et cetera. So there is ample courses for you to pick from just within law and society. But when I was telling you the four ways that a research area affects your time at the Engineering Academy, notice that I did not say it affects your or restricts your selection of courses. Once you're in the program, uh, you can choose whatever elective courses are interesting to you that you and your advisor thinks might be helpful in preparing you for your master's thesis. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary program and we encourage um, scholars to um, be curious, follow their interests, and use different disciplines and different methodologies to help create a unique master's thesis project. So here are some of the courses that are available in, in left politics and international relations, in the middle economics and management. You've already seen uh, the law and society. And here you can see some of the courses that are available and broadly defined the humanities. So if you're doing a um, law course or a law research project in law and society, and you're interested in the historical development of the Chinese legal system from the Republic of China, uh, from the early part of the, the PRC and from the last 22 decades of the PRC, then perhaps it would make sense for you to do a course in history. So we encourage you to um, expand your horizons and follow your interests with the advice that we hope every course you select is potentially helping train you to make you a better scholar for your master's thesis project. Here are some of the thesis topics that recent Yanjing scholars have um, conducted in the law and society research track. So you can see um, one on online courtrooms and local legal systems, China's new international commercial court, um, what its implications are, what its, you know, what its origins were, uh, case studies of environmental social organizations within COVID-19, so um, that could both be legal, you know, the regulatory framework for social organizations or perhaps sociological look at um, how uh, society is organizing itself into organizations focused on uh, environmental protection. Uh, you have the next one is both family issues and the regulatory framework um, in the um, labor contract law in China about parental leave system and um, the ways that um, China, Europe, and, and the US legal systems, a comparative look at how those legal systems deal with um, smart cities and the issue of privacy. So there is a vast, vast diversity of how you can craft your own research project leading up to your own master's thesis um, with interdisciplinary research methodologies. When you're at the Engineering Academy, you will likely have, most likely have two 
faculty advisors here during your two years. We split them as a year one and year two. The first year advisor is called a faculty advisor. Uh, Yanjing scholars will select their faculty advisor within about a month of being on campus. It's through a formal online system that we have that's internal to the Yanjing Academy. And it's a process of mutual selection. You'll look at a, a, a you know, different faculty members bio, their background, their research interests, their publications, their CV. You rank some of them that you're interested in working with, and then you share your profile and your CV with them. And if both the faculty and the student agree, then that's your thesis or your, your faculty advisor for the first year. First year faculty advisors are there in, in a way to be your, your guide into integrating into the academic and faculty communities at uh, Peking University. They'll help you select courses, they'll learn about your developing research interests, and even if they aren't an expert in the very specific field uh, that you eventually land on, the specific topic that you land on for your master's thesis, they will know their colleagues in, in their department or other departments who are experts in their field, and then they'll help you get introductions and introduce you to those other faculty members. At the end of your first year, when you submit your formal thesis proposal, you will do so at the same time as formally uh, selecting your second year advisor, the thesis advisor. And these are some of the departments and schools at Peking University uh, with, that have faculty who have been or have signed up to be um, thesis advisors for Yanjing scholars. We have nearly 200 faculty members uh, who are willing to be advisors for YCAs. Okay, um, so uh, here are some of the kinds of uh, extracurricular cultural activities that Yanjing scholars uh, engage in on the field study course. This is the required course that normally takes place in the fall of your first year at the Yanjing Academy. For the first several years of the program, we took students to uh, Xi'an in Shanxi province. For the last several trips, we've been taking them to Chengdu in Sichuan province. This is a, an intensive week-long assigned, you know, required course, assigned readings, assigned videos and documentaries, uh, site visits. Mm, we go to uh, archaeological excavations and watch the archaeologists at work. We go, we're going to the new brand new opened massive airport outside of Chengdu and get an internal tour that's looking at um, the airport from the process of government officials, city planning, uh, engineering. We also go to uh, leading industries and businesses for site visits, as well as other locations of historic and cultural significance. Here you can see um, how scholars in the topic or in the China in Transition second semester field study uh, component um, with the faculty guidance went out to uh, over 15 different provinces, cities, municipalities, uh, special administrative regions as part of their on the ground training in year one and conducting field research in the PRC. You know, it's really easy for Yanjing scholars or for an international student to hop on a, on a high speed train and go down to Shanghai for a weekend or to go to Xi'an. It's not easy uh, to go down to Guizhou province and visit the world's largest radio telescope. Uh, this is the kind of uh, access that you will get as a Yanjing scholar and as a student of a leading academic researcher at Peking University. So these are some of our students down in, in Guizhou uh, several years ago. These are our students visiting, visiting multiple temples uh, in and around Chongqing a municipality uh, that was formerly part of Sichuan province. Um, as part of Professor Lu Yang's development of Chinese civilization, uh, scholars went there for field research and uh, site visits to better understand one of the regional manifestations of ancient Chinese civilization. Professor Lu is in the picture on the left in the center. He's a distinguished researcher in the Department of History, as well as the Director of Graduate Studies at the Yanjing Academy. You know, you see the panda here. You know, when we take you to Sichuan, of course, we're going to take you to see the pandas. Of course, we'll take you to go eat hot pot. But it's not just about tourism. It is an intensive um, and enriching uh, field site visit and field research experience. And so far, I've really emphasized the academic nature of YCA. 
what you need to do to, to get into the program, advisors, theses, uh, courses, et cetera. But we're not just um, an academic master's degree program. I want you to think about Yanjing Academy as a platform. It's a platform for Yanjing scholars to uh, more deepen their engagement with China, to take their previous experience and training and um, figure out a creative way to apply what they already know to what they're learning with us here. This is a great example. Uh, Through Our Door, Wo Men, is a uh, fantastic multimedia, artistic, and historical exhibition that was organized by, conceptualized by, and organized by, and carried out by Yanjing scholars in the last academic year, the 2020 to 2021 academic year. Um, the young woman in the bottom right of the photo came to my office um, in late September of last year and said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a Harvard graduate and, and theory and art practice. I did a lot of exhibitions at, at Harvard. Is it possible? You know, can I do a multimedia art exhibition using the uh, buildings of Yanjing Academy as my space? And I thought, wow, that's really cool. Uh, but I have no idea if you can do that. We've never done this before. How about get some teams together, bring some of your other colleagues and scholars in, give us a draft proposal and let's see what happens. And she and a team of about 15 Yanjing scholars plus some graduate students and other departments and schools at Peking University put together through our door. Um, it combined um, sculpture, it combined photography and um, colored light displays that changed and made its own temporary art uh, as the sun moved through the sky during the day with um, heavy archival research into the history of the buildings, into the history of Jingyuan Courtyard and specifically Jingyuan Courtyards three and four, going all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s, the era of Yanjing University. Jingyuan Courtyard four was in fact um, the uh, female students dormitory in the 1930s. And so there are oral histories, there are timelines of Jingyuan, both all through the 20th and early 21st century, uh, archival photographs, sculpture. It's really, really uh, an amazing way that our Yanjing scholars showed us how they can combine their experience with their passion and connect it to Peking University and China studies in general. We also try to give our students uh, opportunities for career development training outside of the classroom. Not everyone at Yanjing Academy uh, wants to be a um, doctor, have a PhD and be a China studies related uh, professor or academic. And that's great. You know, we welcome students like that into our program as well. Um, and so our student affairs uh, office colleagues organize a series of voluntary extracurricular events. Um, personality tests, leadership development, um, recruiting opportunities for internships or jobs from corporations and international organizations, uh, leading figures in different fields uh, and uh, different businesses, different walks of life, uh, different career paths. Come to YCA and if interested, Yanjing scholars sign up and get a chance to, to learn from people about their own career paths. Here you can see one of the vice presidents of the AIIB speaking to Yanjing scholars a couple of years ago. Uh, after educate or after graduation, um, Yanjing scholars uh, go on to um, many different uh, career paths. About thirty percent of Yanjing scholars go on to further uh, graduate study, generally at the doctoral level, but also sometimes into law school, maybe an MBA, uh, etc. So thirty percent of our scholars go on to further graduate study, and you can see that they are going to, you know, some of the best universities in the world. These are um, some of the um, multinational corporations or Chinese corporations going global or international organizations or uh, government ministries that Yanjing scholars recently in the last year or two have uh, joined upon graduation. So a really, really excellent success rate for finding top graduate schools or uh, top employment opportunities upon graduation from YCA. This is the Yanjing Global Symposium. It is our flagship extracurricular event every year. 
Um, this is another example of the Engineering Academy as a platform for scholars to explore their interests and um, bring their uh, unique experiences to bear and build something new. In our first cohort in 2015, uh, Yenjing scholars came to our administration at the time and said, hey, we'd really like to do uh, an international China studies uh, conference that focuses on inviting delegates who are in the early stages of their career. Uh, can we do that? And uh, our administration said, give us, give us a proposal and let's see what happens. And five rounds later, um, the Yenjing Global Symposium is a, a renowned and highly competitive international China studies uh, conference. You can see some of the themes that our students have created. This is uh, completely organized and run by Yenjing scholars. Of course, we support them, but scholars join into a steering committee, elect their own co-chair in different positions, budget, you know, et cetera, et cetera, curriculum, et cetera. Um, they identify VIPs and keynote speakers. They put out they identify a theme, put out a call for applications, review those applications, and then uh, in conjunction with the YCA office, they plan um, COVID travel restrictions pending. Uh, we bring everyone to, to Beijing for a long weekend of uh, research presentations, keynote speakers, uh, networking, colloquia, topical discussions, et cetera. Really an amazing um an amazing uh, experience for those who help design and run it, but also for those who join us. Some demographic data on Yenjing scholars uh, in the first seven cohorts. Um, so we've had just under 750 scholars from over 80 different countries and regions. FYI, 0.5 indicates dual citizenship. Um, but we really are a, uh, whether you look at it nationally, linguistically, geographically, uh, politically, um, culturally, we are a very, very diverse um, academic community. And so we value students, uh, we value applicants who um, have a demonstrated commitment to multiculturalism and interest in, or perhaps experience in, um, cross-cultural communication and education in a multicultural environment. Because in our system, where you have people from all over the world uh, taking the same classes together, all interested in, in better understanding China and doing so for the majority of our students in a different culture, in a different academic um, you know, system, it can lead to some very, very unique and enriching uh, cross-cultural opportunities for communication. Sometimes they can be challenging. And so we think it's important for uh, our students to have a demonstrated commitment to uh, respect for different cultures and an interest in uh, education and learning in a multicultural environment. Over the first seven cohorts, you can see these are the universities that have placed the highest number of graduates in the Yanjing Academy program. So really some of the top universities around the world. But of course, you do not have to be from Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge to be accepted into the program. Um, this is just the universities that have placed the highest number into our program. Here you can see the um, breakdown of research areas over the first seven cohorts of Yanjing scholars. Um, law and society is highlighted in red. Over seven years, law and society has occupied 15% of Yanjing scholars' research focus. Um, politics and international relations and economics and management are uh, far and away the more popular. Law and society is, is a strong third, and the humanities uh, come in and, and occupy together about 20%. It's important to mention that we do not have quotas for research areas. This is not planned. You know, if we had quotas, I would certainly like to have a more evenly balanced representation of different research areas. This simply represents what the best applicants every year have chosen, and we've just aggregated that data. Um, most Yanjing scholars come directly with a, out of their bachelor education or the highest level of degree they've attained is a bachelor's degree. This is somewhat skewed because uh, YCA is only allowed to accept applicants from the Chinese mainland uh, immediately after they graduate from university. I'll tell you a little bit more about that coming up in a few minutes. And so 25, 27, 28 uh, my Chinese mainland students per year are only undergraduate, uh, recently graduates of their bachelor program 
Therefore, that um, really increases the number of uh, bachelor's degree and, and sort of skews this data. I would say that probably the average age of Yanjing scholars is roughly around 25 years old. Uh, we don't have an, we don't have age limits, but uh, no one over 28 has ever entered the program. Uh, but again, there's not a hard cutoff. Uh, we take every single applicant and review them individually. If you already have a master's degree or a law degree, et cetera, you are still certainly eligible and encouraged to apply to the program. In the 2021 cohort, that's the seventh cohort of Yanjing scholars, we have 92 scholars from 32 different countries and regions. You know, obviously, over the seven cohorts and in 2021 in particular, we'd like to have more um, uh, Yanjing scholars from Africa and Latin America. Um, part of that is me being, you know, part of my job is building connections with uh, institutions of higher education around the world, going for visits meeting faculty, meeting administrators and advisors, um, doing in-person recruiting, and sort of building a kind of institutional relationship between the Engineering Academy and uh, other universities around the world. Unfortunately, I've not been able to do that because of travel restrictions over the last couple of years, but I'm eager to get back on the road and do so. Uh, this is a, a lower, a smaller cohort than we normally target. We like you know, 120, give or take, each year. But because of the continued um, restriction on um, international students coming to China, uh, some Yanjing scholars last year chose to uh, withdraw their acceptance and potentially try again uh, at a later date. In the 2021 cohort, you can see these are the 18 universities with the highest number of placements in our program. Oxford with five, Stanford with four, Stanford, UCL, University College London, University of Cape Town, and Sun Yat-sen, all with four in general. Law and society um, uh, grew a little bit in the 2021 cohort, getting up to 18%. We also saw uh, some nice growth in literature and culture as well. That was good to see. But still, politics, international relations, and economics and management remain the most popular. OK. Let me rehydrate. All right. So what are we looking for in applicants? Um, well, as a fully funded, highly competitive academic graduate program in uh, China's top university, you know, an outstanding academic record is essential. You know, you're going to be competing against some very, very bright people in the application process. And so we absolutely value uh, excellence in the classroom. But we're not just interested in your GPA, uh, the name of the university you went to, or your, uh, the grades on your academic transcript. We want to know more about each of our applicants as individuals. Uh, we want to know how you can not only be a good student here, how you can also contribute to and enrich uh, the student community on campus, as well as the growing uh, alumni community for YCA. So we also value um, leadership experience, leadership potential, extracurricular activities like community service, athletics, art, um, you, know, you know, startup experience, all of those things. If there's something that you have dedicated a serious portion of your time and energy to that you think helps shape who you are as a young person and as a young professional, then we want to hear about that. So um, we're not just looking at your academic record and nothing else. As I mentioned before, because of our multicultural learning environment, we uh, value applicants who have a demonstrated commitment to multiculturalism and learning and, uh, and, and sort of cross-cultural communication. You know, you do not have to be on the path to becoming a professor of Chinese history or East Asian languages and literatures, um, et cetera, to be accepted into the program. Every year we have students who are on that path and great, we welcome them. You do not have to be fluent in Chinese or have lived in China uh, to get into the program. You know, you can, be, uh, you can be outstanding in other fields. And then at this point in your career, whether you're just about to graduate from your bachelor's program or you finished an MBA um, or you're about to finish a legal a law degree, if at this point in your career you realize Oh, in order to go where I want to go in my career, I need to see what's happening in China. I need to figure out 
what I know in say the legal system or what I know in uh, biotech investment. I, in the US and Europe, I don't really know what's happening in China. And so I need to, to bring my experience to bear and learn about how my fields are, um, what's happening in my fields in China. That's also a very coherent narrative for why you want to come to the program. And every year we welcome a significant portion of uh, outstanding students who at this point in their young careers decide that they need to uh, gain experience and knowledge of China. But if you are you know, uh, fluent in Chinese after four or five years of intensive language study, and you have a really good academic record related to East Asian or Chinese studies, that can be helpful for you. If that's one of your strengths, then you should definitely emphasize it in your application package. And just like any graduate application, any job application, you need to tell us why you want to come to our program. You need to answer a few questions like, um, you know, why China? Why China now at this point in your career? Why Yanjing Academy? And why should we admit you into the program? So, you know, what are your career paths? What are your career plans? How can studying with us for two years help us achieve, help you achieve those goals? Um, these are things that you need to have a, a well articulated rationale for why you're interested in our program. And English proficiency is required. Um, if you are a non-native English speaker, in most cases, you will need to submit um, one of the standard um, uh, standardized tests for assessing English language proficiency, Cambridge, IELTS, TOEFL, et cetera. If you are a non-native English speaker who attended a university, a degree program, a university or graduate program where the official language is English, then you aren't required to do that. If, however, <laughs> you are from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, and you, uh, let's say, attended um, NYU, taught in English, you will, however, have to still have to submit an English test score because of a parallel application process at Peking University uh, for applicants from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. I'll tell you more about that coming up next. So um, unfortunately, at this point, we are only able to uh, accept applications from citizens of the PRC if they have, one, attended university in mainland China, and two, in their school or department have qualified for exemption from the National Postgraduate Entrance Examination. You have to be from certain universities, certain rankings of universities that have Zhe and you have to have certain GPA and rankings and recommendations from your school or department at that university that allow you to um, we have uh, We're working on opening up some other application routes for PRC citizens, perhaps those who have done their undergraduate work abroad. We have some proposals in under review, but I don't think that will be available during this admission cycle. Uh, I'm sorry if that's bad news for you, uh, but I encourage you to please continue to pay attention to the Engineering Academy because that might be changing at some point in the near future. The minimum requirement for uh, acceptance or for potential uh, consideration for becoming a Yanjing scholar is finishing your bachelor's degree before you enroll. So if you are considering applying this fall for enrollment in 2022, you must finish your bachelor's degree and have graduated by August 31st of 2022. If you are from Hong Kong, Macau, or Taiwan, you will apply to us in the same way as you'll see in the next slide, but you also have, at the same time, a parallel application process um, to Peking University's uh, application portal specifically for scholars from or students from Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. If that fits your uh, background, you must go to our website and you must read closely under the admissions tab all the detailed information about this parallel application process for um, applicants from those three areas. Okay, uh, applications are open. The system is open now. Uh, the system, the application portal closes on December 3rd, 2021. So December 3rd, 2021, 12 p.m. Beijing time. Get your applications in by then.
You'll do all your application materials at yenjingacademy.pku.edu.cn. Um, you may need a certificate of English proficiency based on what I've just told you. Um, you will need, if you're still in your uh, bachelor's degree program, we will need a certificate of enrollment from your university or current graduate program. That's generally a formal document from your university registrar saying, yes, um, you know, such and such a student is currently enrolled in this degree program here. If you have already graduated from, say, a bachelor's program and are currently in an MA program, we will need to see the diploma of all degree programs from which you have already graduated. Um, we will need to see official transcripts, grade transcripts, you know, course listings from all institutions of higher education you've attended. Uh, we will need a personal statement in English of no more than 750 words. This is introducing who you are, how you can contribute to our program, why you're interested in our program, uh, where you wanna go with your career and how we can help you achieve your career goals. Plus a statement of research interest. Now we've slightly updated this research component to the application this year. And I'll tell you about how we've done so. Last year, we called it simply a research proposal and it was about a thousand words. Um, this year, we're giving more space to uh, more potential space. You don't have to go to the 1500 word limit, but you can. And we're calling it a statement of research interest because um, you know, if you have a very clearly defined research project already, and you know this is what you wanna do, if you honestly know this is what you wanna do, you can submit a formal research proposal to us. But it's okay if you don't exactly know specifically what your actual topic is, what your specific research questions are, exactly which methodologies and sources you hope to use to answer that. That's still okay. You're not yet in a master's program. So think of the statement of research interest as the first step in a multi-year, a two or and a half year conversation you will be having with faculty at the Engineering Academy and at Peking University about your developing research interest or interests. Um, it is, however, a formal academic document. You need to write in formal English. You need to base your context of the topic, your interest in the topic, your um, potential methodologies, your suggested ways for answering uh, or digging into the topic, you do need to base all of that on secondary academic literature. You know, you're applying to a competitive graduate program. You should never write about research without reference to academic literature. And then you should give us some ideas of how you hope to um, address the topic, answer the questions or address the topic that you're talking about. You can tell us about more than one uh, research interest. If maybe you know you're interested in, you know, Chinese society through a sociological lens, but you maybe want to look at um, urban rural divide, or you maybe want to look at <clears throat> education, or maybe you want to look at family and gender, you can tell us a little bit about the cluster of interests you're, you're, you're focusing on. Uh, that's okay too. But remember, um, you need to be able to balance telling us about the breadth of your research interests in contrast with having enough space to give us enough, uh, to go deep enough to let us know how you analyze, how you think, and how you write about research. That's a balance you'll need to, to try to strike. Um, we'll need to see your CV, your resume, and very importantly, two letters of recommendation. According to the standards of this kind of program all across China and the regulations of uh, Peking University, these official letters of recommendation must be from academic uh, writers, professors, and they must be from the associate professor or full professor level or the equivalent. Unfortunately, assistant professors can, are not qualified in the regulations of Peking University to fill one of these official letters of recommendation. If you have um, an assistant professor or a lecturer or an, an internship manager who you think can speak to your, your talents and your potential, they are welcome to submit letters on your behalf. Those just must be submitted as uh, additional documents, not as um, these two academic letters of recommendation. 
here we are uh, at more or less the end of my presentation. I appreciate your attention and your time. I see some of the questions in the Q&A. We will get to those. Um, please go to our website, ngacademy.pku.edu.cn. Look at our admissions process, study it, learn our curriculum, uh, look at faculty profiles, look at the profiles of current Yenjing scholars. That'll give you a sense of the different paths um, that, that, Yenjing, that students have taken to become Yenjing scholars, uh, different backgrounds, different academic training, different interests, different professional experience, how there's such a multiplicity of ways to become a Yanjing scholar because we do not have one single type or one single profile of applicants that we're looking for. Um, there are many, many ways that you can become a Yanjing scholar. Similarly, there isn't one single experience that every Yanjing scholar that, you know, that they can summarize their time with us. Um, we have people from all over the world, from all different backgrounds, from all different interests, all focusing on China, but uh, they took many paths to get here. And because of that, they can also take many paths and have many different kinds of experiences uh, at YCA, um, utilizing the platform uh, for research inquiry and for personal growth and professional um, promise that we offer. You can follow us on all those social media sites you see below. If you're using WeChat, you can scan the uh, QR code in the bottom left and uh, add uh, and follow our official WeChat account. We push out um, updates on what's going on here uh, several times a week. Um, before we have, um, we have two alumni speakers who are gonna join us now. And we're very fortunate to have them. Uh, before we move into that, uh, let me address one question. Uh, the big question that uh, was in the, um, that was in the Q and A. Um, anonymous attendee, uh, nice to meet you, anonymous attendee. Uh, sorry, you've probably heard, you're probably tired of hearing this question, but do you have any idea from conversations with government about when the border may reopen to international students? In particular, is there any chance that Yanjing scholars will be able to enter sooner than other students because it's a special scholarship program? Um, okay. Um, no, I mean, we hear that question a lot. Um, I'm not tired of it because it's a very, very important question. Um, here's what we know. Here's what we're doing and here's what we don't know. First off, there has been no official communication, no official policy statement given to us independently, privately or publicly about when international students can come to China. Um, so, you know, there have been unofficial things, uh, predictions, things like that, that are worth remembering and sort of filing away as data points. For instance, the head of the Center for Disease Control in China said that he thought, personally thought that um, reaching 85% full vaccination rate nationwide made sense to, it, it made sense at that point to reopen the borders or begin to reopen the borders. And he projected that 85% vaccination rate would hit, would be achieved in January of 2022. Interesting. And he's an influential figure, but it's not an official statement. And until we hear an official statement from the government, it doesn't really matter. Um, so we don't know when it's going to happen. What I can say is that we've been working tirelessly on getting Engine scholars to campus for the last year and a half or more. We have made some very good progress. Um, the, mm, we have a very detailed proposal um, about uh, including scholars' personal information, where they would be flying from, their likely uh, you know, flight routes to China, how we will support them going through the quarantine process, how we will arrange the um, week-long health inspection period before they're, you know, that's not full quarantine, but before they're allowed to come on campus, um, financial issues, et cetera. We have a very detailed and I think convincing proposal. Peking University has approved that uh, proposal. We are now, we have now submitted that proposal, next step up the ladder um, to uh, government agencies that need to be part of this decision-making process. Um, we submitted that uh, in late July. Uh, in June and July, there was a, it felt like we had a lot of momentum and there was a lot of progress made. 
But after we submitted our proposal, that coincided literally within a matter of days of the first uh, reportings of Delta variant outbreaks in China. And so that um, slowed our momentum and uh, hindered the progress that we had been making before. We were still uh, in the sort of um, waiting period. We have our proposal. Um, we are waiting to hear for its approval or hear if there are any questions or things that we need to change. I think you can understand that um, these kinds of processes and these kinds of decisions here in China don't take place publicly. Um, it is, you know, the decision makers um, have their own set of priorities. Uh, we have made an appeal with a what we think is a convincing proposal for how we would deal with uh, potential concerns. And we are eagerly waiting to hear back. Um, this is not a negotiation we're having. Um, it just doesn't it just doesn't work that way. But uh, please rest assured that we're doing everything that we can and everything we should be doing to make this happen as soon as possible. I am hopeful that Yanjing scholars will be with us on campus sooner rather than later, but I cannot make any predictions about when it will happen. Um, it, it, there's just, it, it's just impossible, me, impossible for me to do so. Uh, that having been said, you know, Yanjing scholars have been uh, online for the last year and a half, and I've been incredibly impressed with the effort they put in, the success in classes and in defending their theses, uh, and the zeal almost with which they have built a community with Yanjing scholars, generally online and through where possible, you know, local regional meetups uh, in the places where they are currently located. Um, it is still a um, very, very worthwhile experience. It will certainly change your career, potentially change your life. You still receive a world-class education about China and a world-class training in research methodology uh, to create a unique and fascinating master's thesis in China studies and receive a diploma from Peking University. Being a Yanjing scholar means something. Um, it is hard to do, but once you make it, it opens doors and it carries weight. Um, both in China and in greater China, absolutely, but also uh, in circles around the world that are connected to China. People who know, get it. Um, so I still encourage all of you to apply. Um, now that having been said, uh, distance learning and online Yanjing Academy um, is not uh, everything that we want to offer you. It is not everything that you hope to uh, experience and receive, because until you can be on the ground in Beijing, meeting with us and faculty, uh, sharing classes and, you know, leisure time with fellow Yanjing scholars, getting to know Beijing, traveling in China, um, that's, that's a key part of what I know that every Yanjing scholar wants. And um, I can't say that we can replace that um, online. So um, that's what we know. That's what we're doing, and that's what we don't know at this point. Uh, and on that, uh, and on that note, I'm going to wrap up my presentation. Uh, stop sharing my screen, and uh, I would like to welcome one of our um, Yanjing Academy alumni. Um, I don't know who uh, enrolled in the program first, Pei Xuan and uh, Fei. Um, why don't one of you just turn on your microphone and start sharing your screen? And then uh, you can, the floor can be yours. Hi. Hey. Hey. Hey, patient. Do you want to go first or should I go first? You can. You well, can your first. camera, yeah, yeah, your camera's on. So why don't you just uh, go ahead? Sure. Hi. Um, hello. I hope everyone who's um, at this presentation. Um, learned what they needed to know and hope that everyone's having a good day in their respective time zones. Um, my name is Fei Zhang um, and Pei and I are both this cohorters. 
um, which was kind of a unique cohort because we were like caught in the middle of COVID. We had half a year um, on campus, which was really great, amazing. Um, and then in January, um, I and many other people left the country to go home uh, and travel. Um, and then the whole pandemic happened. So it was a really unique situation. So um, if anyone does have any questions about how distance learning works, um, feel free to contact me. I can share my contact information later. Um, but a little bit about myself. Let me share my screen now, actually. Okay, did that work? Can you see my screen? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, cool. So I'm Fei uh, Zhang Yan in Chinese. Um, and that picture is actually a trip that we took to the Great Wall during my first semester at Yanqing. And we stayed, um, we stayed there. We camped overnight. Um, it was freezing cold. <laughs> Um, but then we woke up at like 5 a.m. and we like went to watch the sunset over the Great Wall. It was really amazing, really cool. Okay, so I am in the fifth cohort. Um, I'm from the U.S., but my family is um, Chinese, Chinese American. I studied English and visual and environmental studies um, in undergraduate, and then I did a visual anthropology program in the University of Manchester in the U.K. Um, I was mostly involved in writing and arts organizations as an undergraduate um, outside of academics. I really like hiking um, and running, although I haven't been doing as much as I want to. Um, but for those of you who do like that, Beijing and China in general, um, there's a lot of really uh, wonderful, diverse natural landscapes to, landscapes to explore. Um, so if you do get to go to China, um, that's definitely something that um, I would really recommend. Um, you can feel free to contact me for WeChat info for like organizations for pursuits like that, um, if that's something you're interested in and if you get to be in China. Um, as for YCA, I did uh, the Weiming Writers Club, which is a writing club, participated in the arts and film clubs, um, step aerobics, the group of us would like um, <laughs> do a, uh, it was like a six week challenge and we would do like uh, um, 25 minutes step aerobics in the morning because we wanted to get in shape. Um, and it worked pretty well, you know, it was really hard and like we would always be like sweaty and then people would like come in with donuts or like cake or whatever. And like, yeah, it was really funny. Um, we had a napping club, which is a joke, like it's not, you know, it was a club started as a joke, but I think it shows that um, you build community really quickly in Yanqing um, and you find that people have like really great senses of humor and you get really comfortable with each other. Um, so those are extracurriculars. You can form your own extracurriculars um, at YCA. So currently I am a PhD candidate in media arts and practice at University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. Um, I'm both a scholar and a practitioner of film and visual art. Um, so how did Yenching help in this pursuit? You know, I think um, the humanities are somewhat underrepresented uh, in terms of the cohort, um, but there's no quota. So um, as a humanities person, I did feel very welcomed at Yenching um, and studying and doing um, and, di and diving into research topics renewed my interest in using creative media to explore China and also helped me practice research skills that are really necessary for an academic artist. Okay, so my motivation to apply for YCA, um, partly my family connection and a desire to dig into that history um, in an academic way. Um, you see this picture, that's a picture, my grandma's in that picture, she is sitting to the left of this man, she was a barefoot doctor um, in the 1950s and 1960s, so I was interested in like researching family history in the context of China's larger history and how it influences modern development. Um, so why did I study law and society instead of say literature, culture, or um, you know something like that? Um, because I wanted to understand China's modern changing society. I didn't necessarily want to do as much um, archival research 
Um, but I realized that I could do that historical research within law and society. No, no one's saying that you can't do historical research or research into literature um, if you're in law and society. You know, you can still do that, but you can frame it within these classes that also teach you about China's modern society. Now, I was particularly interested in civic participation arts and in my um, final, my thesis, the environment. Um, as for my experience as a Yanqing scholar, um, I found a really vibrant cohort. Everyone was completely unique and had their unique perspective and knowledge of China and also came from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, you know, it's just, I think Peishan will tell you about her professional background, but just people who have had a lot of different life experiences in different countries. And that was really cool. So obviously COVID brought challenges um, because um, I was out of the country and um, it was harder to do research remotely, but it also kind of forced me to grow and to find new ways, you know, to be really dedicated. Like, okay, this is what I want to do. There are these challenges that life will throw at you, but you figure out ways to cope, um, figure out ways through it. So that's the valuable skill to learn. So even if um, you do have, if you do decide to apply and have a remote experience, um, it will probably be a challenge, but not necessarily a bad challenge. Um, some of the favorite classes I took included qualitative research methods with um, Professor Ran Zhong, uh, my thesis advisor, who I also ended up being a teaching assistant for next semester, um, Chinese constitutional law and academic writing and critical thinking. So pretty practice-based classes. Those were the ones I enjoyed the most. So classes that let you choose a project. Um, and kind of gives you a framework and tools and um, advice from the professor to pursue that project. Um, for anyone who's applying, I would say um, as, um, as um, Brent Haas said in his um, um, presentation, you should really reflect on and articulate your interest in China and explain what you want to achieve with the scholarship. And also think about, you know, what will you bring to the community? Um, what are your perspectives and experiences? Um, what will you add to it? You know, it doesn't have to be, it can be something like an exhibition, like, um, you know, like the woman exhibition or participating in the conference. Um, but it can be something small. You know, we had students in our cohort who were really into photography and they ended up, you know, helping everyone take photos that capture you know, special moments during their time. So anything like that would be, would be good too. Um, whether or not you do have experience in China studies um, or whether or not you do already have a research idea in mind, I would say as someone who's really in the PhD world now, ask for help. Um, work with professors. If you're in school, work with professors at your university um, including experts in your subject area or China issues to develop an idea of what you'd want to research. Don't do it alone because there is like thousands of um, academics who have researched who you know who have subject matter matter expertise. So if you have an idea in mind, reach out to the person who has written a paper or a book on it, um, or who kind of knows that area and ask them to to help you. Um, and most people are pretty nice. You know, most people will at least be willing to help you, you know, have a phone call, talk through ideas. You can reach out to multiple people. Um, yeah, just try to get as much help as you can. Um, if you're not in school right now, um, I say most professors are, you know, it's their job to teach and to disseminate knowledge. So if you reach out to um, a handful of people, um, it's more likely that you'll find someone who is willing to help you develop your research area and your proposal and your methodology and things like that. Um, try to narrow down your topic within the larger field. You have to write the research proposal. So um, that's one thing I have, I have trouble with. I tend to bite off a lot, but I find that narrowing down, um, going deeper is often easier and better than doing um, too broad of an idea. Um, so my thesis, which most of the research was done outside of China, unfortunately, um, I have been planning to do field work um, if possible, but uh, the title was Case Study of Three Environmental Social Organizations in China in the Context of the COVID-19 Pandemic. 
Um, and the people, the um, NGOs, the organizations I ended up talking to, they were very willing to give interviews, um, especially if you're a researcher from Peking University, you know, it kind of carries like a name cachet. So if you say, hey, I'm a student here, um, I want to do a research project, can I interview you? Can I, you know, if possible, can I come and do field work? Um, a lot of people will be very willing. So that, that's one way that Yanjing makes doing research easier is that it kind of opens that door. Okay, so I won't go through this whole thing, but it's kind of a timeline of some ideas in my thesis. I developed it during COVID, you know, I felt kind of like uh, helpless in a way, you know, this big uh, pandemic is happening, but I want to learn about it and learn about what's happening in China. So in a nutshell, basically what I found out is that um, it was kind of, it was a time for Chinese environmental NGOs to capture the moment and to push forward a lot of um, new wildlife regulations and to raise the profile of wildlife issues um, because of the discussion that was happening about um, you know, wildlife being an originator for viruses at that time. Um, so that's what I was looking into. Um, if you have more specific questions about it, um, if it's something you're interested in, feel free to email me. Okay, so yeah, that's it for me. Um, I think we we're taking questions at the end, so I'll just wrap up, wrap up for now. But thank you for um, doing me talk. Oh, Faye, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a couple of follow-ups I'd like to touch on. First off, that, that case study, uh, that timeline you're showing us right now, that's really excellent work. Um, I don't know if that was specifically written into, the narrative was written into your thesis, but I think that's a great example of the kind of, um, I mean, that's just good work that you need to do to really grasp um, the thesis topic that you are engaging in, even if you're not simply narrating that timeline there. So, wow, that's very impressive stuff. Uh, good job. Um, also, um, I think your, your point about reaching out for help, um, reaching out to academic mentors, to professors, to, to people who, who know you and will support you as you're preparing your application materials, um, specifically your statement of research interest, that's really, really important advice. Um, so I encourage everyone who's considering and applying to don't do it yourself. You know, reach out to the people who have helped get you where you are today. And um, I expect that they will be willing to assist you in, in the process as you're trying to apply to, to the NG Academy. So that's a really excellent advice too. I appreciate that. And then finally, I, yeah, I can't wait to see your work. I mean, uh, USC film is uh, very, very impressive. Um, not nearly as impressive, as impressive, but um, perhaps interesting. I was, I was just in a movie. Um, because there aren't that many, you know, foreign actors in town uh, that have that can speak Chinese. Friends of friends in the film industry just uh, uh, asked me to do an audition, and I got the part. And I went and filmed for eight days in Zhejiang, a, a, low, a small budget uh, sort of art family drama film that uh, there. I think they're going to try the film circuit, you know, Khan wow. and you know, I don't know Tribeca and everything like that. So. Uh, you never, you never know what opportunities can uh, drop into your lap while you're uh, here at the Yanjing Academy. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you and I will see each other on the red carpet at some point in the future. Yeah. Obviously, that's uh, completely a joke, but uh, I'm serious about the film. But you know, us uh, walking down the red carpet is, is definitely uh, tongue in cheek. But thanks for your, your presentation. Um, if you'll stop sharing your screen now, then we can... Um, yeah. We can welcome our next alumni speaker to uh, grab the mic. Uh, Pei Xuan, the uh, floor is now yours. Hi, thanks. Thanks for helping me with the slides. Can you hear me well? Okay, yes. cool. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Pei Xuan. I was a uh, cohort mates with Fei in the 2019 to 2021 cohort. So we just graduated this year. I'm Singaporean and I got my undergrad degree at the LSE. Uh, in law. And then on my graduate degree, of course, I graduated from Yanjing Academy. Uh, next slide. Yes. So this is a little bit about me. Uh, in LSC, I was just like a standard like uh, person who was training in law. Uh, I played rugby for the women's team. But then um, like, uh, I think in Yanjing actually just gave me a lot of like 
like broader horizons to explore because uh, I came to uni as like a leftin. Uh, I was the second leftin when I first uh, started uni, and then I became uh, I uh, was promoted to leftin in the middle of my undergrad degree. So um, my c- career basically is that I have I am a naval officer in the Sing- in the Republic of Singapore Navy uh, for the past five six years. Uh, it's my first job and my only job so far. So it's been quite a while. And I served on board like um, a mine countermeasure vessel, and I did a staff tour at Naval Operations Department. Uh, following which, most recently, I was involved in the COVID task force in Singapore, uh, dealing with the um, reemergent infections back in 2020. And right now, I am undergoing a navigation training to um, further my career as a surface warfare officer. So I entered university doing law, but also being a naval officer. So I didn't really have an intention to practice law. Uh, and like what really led me to Yanqing, as I will elaborate on later, was because um, of my experiences in law. But then uh, in Yanqing, I was able to like, sort of step out of my comfort zone, be like both academically and like uh, holistically, which is I, I was granted the opportunity to co-chair the Yanqing Global Symposium of 2020, which uh, unfortunately didn't manifest because of the COVID pandemic, which led us to uh, postpone and ultimately cancel the uh, symposium for that year. But, you know, the, we prepared for it and we had like all sorts of plans lined up and we tried to pass that on to the next batch, which did, um, you know, the shared renewal symposium. Um, I also chaired the Yanqing Consent Task Force, which is something that we started from the ground up. Uh, and then I was also a residential advisor from uh, 2020 to 21. Um, and these are just a bunch of awards that I picked up on the way during my uh, time in Yancheng. Uh, next slide. Uh, yes, yeah, so, okay, why I applied for Yancheng? So um, uh, as I was, a, you know, my background was that I, a naval officer trained in law, uh, I was looking out for opportunities to further my grad, to, to pursue my graduate degree. And I came across this thing called the Yancheng Global Symposium. And I was like, this is really interesting that I really want to attend the symposium. But the symposium was only open to students that were uh, in graduate school. So, and back then I was still an undergraduate. So I was thinking, okay, when I'm in graduate school, I have to apply for the YGS. Uh, but then I think looking at YGS and I was like, what is Yan Cheng? So I clicked on a link and like one link led me to another link. And I learned about all this, like this program called the Yan Cheng Academy. So and an opportunity to apply for the Yancheng Academy actually arose before the opportunity for application into the uh, Yancheng Global Symposium arose. And therefore I applied for uh, YCA before YGS and I got into YCA. And then after getting into YCA, I had a chance to chair YGS. So that was like sort of coming full circle. And so that was my first introduction to Yancheng. Um, and secondly, because I was uh, doing law in London and it was very much, I was like trying to focus on international law because that's the most helpful aspect for about law uh, as in my career as a naval officer. What I learned was that a lot of people who were teaching me were from, you know, um, for, from like very sort of uh, more Eurocentric countries. They were from like mostly Australia or the UK, even though they were nominally teaching international law. So my curriculum wasn't that international or the people that I was talking to, the perspectives that I was, um, I was able to learn from were not as international as I liked it to be. And because of this paradox, it led me to pursue like, what does China think? Or what is like, what do other countries think about international law? What are their perspectives and what, how do they interpret or apply international law? So uh, for my thesis in undergrad, I focused on how China uh, looks at international law, especially in the law of the sea, uh, with a case study on the South China Sea dispute. And that was something that uh, car- that I continued working on during my time in uh, Yanqing, as I will elaborate on later. And then I think my third reason for applying was because um, Yanqing allowed uh, interdisciplinary ac- uh, academic offerings, which, ac- which I felt that would help me make better de- decisions as a new officer in the future when, you know, it's like a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world where we need to have people with multiple skill sets to ch- deal with complex problems. And I felt like only having a degree in law would only allow me to bring one perspective to the table, which is like a very legal, like a legal perspective. Whereas like the Yancheng Academy offered sort of like, oh, sort of like a liberal arts 
curriculum that I didn't have the opportunity to, to access in undergrad because um, my law degree was very specific. It was very like professional and very, um, it was very much like driven to develop us to become good lawyers and not so much like thinkers in other fields. So Yanqing Academy gave me that opportunity to broaden my own horizons intellectually. So as a Yanqing scholar, I wasn't disappointed. Uh, it challenged me to step on my comfort zone. I did many, many courses that were like beyond law. I, I did courses on the modern Chinese history, on um, Chinese literature. I did courses on like Chinese foreign politics and as well as like um, the education system in China. It was just like really diverse. And that is something that I would not have gotten in, in, in another graduate degree, especially like if I were to do an LLM in like the States, which was, was one of the options that I was considering. Uh, and secondly, I think there were so many opportunities to start and join clubs, events, and societies, like Faye mentioned. Uh, I, uh, I think this is something that I couldn't do in, other, in my undergrad university as well, uh, because the Yen Ching just gives you so much latitude and space to explore your interests, like you know, hiking, climbing. Uh, I also started the Yen Ching Cinema, Acad uh, Cinema Academy, it's sort of like a film club. That, that was really fun. Like we would screen movies every week for people who are interested in learning more about China or like movies about like art house movies or just like, you know, uh, movies like Nurja, which was like a popular sort of uh, animated movie back then. Uh, and then like thirdly, it was really, really fun because I had, even though I was only there for a semester because of COVID, uh, I felt that that was the best semester of my life so far. Like the people that I met were so interesting and really brought, really sort of uh, helped me see things from different light because you had people from different walks of life from different nations and different continents, as well as people who were pursuing different careers. You had people who were doing the PhDs, you had the people who were in the military, you had a bunch of people who are wanted to work in government and you had the NGO people, and then you also had like the finance people. So this is something that I didn't get in my undergrad degree because all I hung out with were lawyers. Uh, and for my work, it was just like military people. Then lastly, I think I had the sort of privilege to benefit from this diverse, global and invaluable network of future leaders interested in China. So today, some of my closest friends are from Yanqing, even though, you know, we're all sort of dispersed across the globe. I still like regularly try to keep in touch with my friends from Yanqing. And, you know, when I had a chance, like back before COVID happened, I was like traveling the world with a bunch of Yanqing scholars, visiting them in their hometowns. And even after COVID happened, we all like made promises to visit each other. And we still keep in touch with each other's lives. And so that really opens up a lot of like networks for future growth. Like, you know, in the future, let's say if I wanted to go to Japan for whatever reason, like I know that I have friends to count on there. And in the future, let's say if I'm posted to China in the course of my career, I know that I'm not going to China like as a as, like, alone. I know that I will have people in China that I can count on to have my back, even if I'm like, going there as a representative of Singapore. Yeah, so next slide. Uh, yeah, so some of my suggestions to uh, prospective students in your application is to reflect on the following. Firstly, what is your story? How does China feature in your future? What, what is China in relation to you? And where do you see China uh, in the future as well as like, like you don't necessarily have to be in China, but what does that mean to your future and your work or whatever you're interested in? Yeah, intellectually or you know just like out of like curiosity uh, secondly like what do you aspire to achieve with this opportunity how can you uh, make the best out of the Yanqing Academy scholarship like what is the difference between a Yanqing Academy scholarship and like a opportunity from another university in China what is so unique that Yanqing can offer you to achieve your dreams then thirdly, I think what's something you can reflect on is what is your value proposition to the Yanqing community? What can you bring to the table? Um, you know, what, what kind of passions you have? Uh, how can you turn that passion into something that can add, uh, you know, sort of can, can um, add value to the community, can benefit your peers and yourself as well? Like, for instance, we have people who are really good at yoga, and so they volunteer to teach a yoga class. Uh, I, I had people who um, I was talking to a bunch of people like uh, like lawyers who practice in Latin America and they were telling me how they saw China during in the midst of their practice and that really also helped me shape my views in my thesis. Uh, I also was able to bounce my ideas off you know people who were interested in Chinese philosophy uh, and then asking them how do you think that works in relation to China's approach to international law right now. So it really just um, created this sort of a multifaceted approach to which I, I could take towards my thesis, 
which um, is titled Contested Waters, Contesting Stories, uh, Navigating the Narratives Surrounding China's Claims to Historic Rights in the South China Sea. And I think I wouldn't have been able to develop this thesis if I didn't have the opportunity to uh, access different courses and you know talk to different people in the course of my um, time in Yancheng and my very short time in China, because um, it, I use like a sort of a different interdisciplinary uh, approaches in looking at my thesis and not so much like a purely legalistic approach, but I was like bringing in history, sociology and jurisprudence in my analysis. And that's something that I wasn't able to do as well in undergrad because in, in undergraduate, in, the, in my undergraduate degree, I was looking at things from a very like specific targeted like practitioner's lens. And whereas like, Yanqing really helped me to broaden my horizons. So I think looking at the difference between my undergrad thesis and my postgrad thesis, I could really see the evolution in my thought process and that wouldn't have been possible without Yanqing. Yeah, so I think I'm done with my, my talk. Uh, any questions or clarifications you have for me? Thank you so much, Patreon, um, and, and to Faye as well. It's always great to, to hear from you and to hear with a little bit of time removed, uh, your thoughts about your experience here. Um, I always learn a lot listening to um, alumni presentations in these groups or in these events, and today is no exception.